We've got our 10 things to remember episode today. Our lessons learned from this past year of fantasy football. You do not want to miss any of them. Make sure you click subscribe and enjoy. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Oh, welcome in. Excited to have you with us, the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Jason Moore, Mike, the Fantasy Hitman, right? I'm Andy Holloway. Jason is in writing position. What is happening over here? Well, I'm just, you know, doing some research. Just doing some stats? Doing some stats on uh, our quick question here coming up. All I see is the price of Bitcoin down on your... <laughs> is that what that is? That is not. Oh, okay. All right. Welcome in one and all. We've got a fun show. Uh, the 10 Things to Remember episode. Fresh off of a, uh, a, as far as I'm concerned, fantastic season of fantasy football. Oh, it, I mean, great year. Great year, right? Great year. The, great Champ. year for the show. Great year for me personally. Yeah, I mean, just uh, I had a good time. So uh, there's lots to remember. I mean, Jason, you probably lots remember, to remember. You I remember. remember the playoffs. and I remember my championship. I, I think Papa what? Josh. In 2022. When was that? <laughs> Papa Josh, you probably remember a lot from this past year too, right? I mean, you were you had a good time. It was a great time, except for the ending. Yeah, so so we're doing our 10 things to remember. Jason, did you uh, did all of your items this year on the show, as we count them down later, did they all come from your uh, little black book? Um, yeah, basically this, this year, uh, it was one of those things where I wanted to remember them in the moment. Cause we never, we we're all goldfish uh, other than Mike. Uh, right. Mike. That's why I don't trap. even remember your championship from 2022. Right. Thank you. Um, y you know, so it's like when I, when I see these lessons, in fact, one of the things that I am bringing up today was something I told Brooks on the show mid show. I was like, Hey Brooks, you got to remind me to bring this up on the things to remember because it was a lesson we had learned and I'm like there's a this is something I can't forget I forgot all about it so Brooks brought it up Brooks brought it up because wow. that was his job he, uh, he was ordered to do it and he he obeyed well um and so yeah thank you Brooks so when Jay when you are uh post-mortem we'll just we'll put it that way <laughs> is uh is your little black book going to be the thing that's auctioned off yeah, probably, probably. Like, you know, like yeah, the like, celebrity stuff. Or is like, it just numbers and stats, or and, and little notes, or little do you have some memoir, memoirs in there? No, it's all. Like, it's, it's it's today. I got one for you. Okay. Uh, today I traded C D Lamb for Jalen Waddle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was that in there? No. Oh. Less of a diary. Okay. It's yeah. it's just pictures of stick men. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's it's, nothing in that book, man. There's. Oh my nothing. gosh, I, that's the great. <laughs> trick uh, all these years later you've no never, one has you've never written anything in it actually seen inside so you don't know what the contents are and someday after i die you're gonna go over there and you're gonna open the book and you're gonna turn page by page you're gonna say this book is empty <laughs> <There's>, <laughs> these are all blank pages there's literally nothing in this book just a few brave heart quotes in there um we're excited about today's show. Can't wait to get into it. Got a quick question that was snuck in here by Kyle that we'll get to in a moment. <laughs> uh, quick reminder, it's the last day. Oh, the last the day. The last one? Yeah, it's your last chance. Get into uh, or head over to ultimatedraftkit.com. Um, you have a chance to come play with us in the Listener League. If you order by March 1st, uh, you've got yourself a shot at playing with us, trying to take out Mike. The fantasy hitman in the you listener league. You can try, and you may succeed. You might. And uh, so we've got kind of the best price right now. Chance to jump into the Dynasty Pass. Uh, you can learn more about that at ultimatedraftkit.com. Clock's ticking. The quick question that Kyle snuck in is because we had some conversation briefly on Slack, and you know some people are just Debbie Downers and don't want to – Look on the bright side of anything, well, but some of us are Randy realists. Ooh, is that, that was, what you? That was the first bad. name that's not that popped bad. in my head. Uh, 
So the question is, is there hope for Jamison Williams in 2024? Is he worth a late round pick in redraft? And this all came out of head coach Dan Campbell uh, at a press conference was <laughs> asked about Jamison Williams. And like his quote is, he's going to push to be a full-time starter. <laughs> and that's what we're looking for. Everyone grows at a different rate. Maybe it, it's taken him a little bit longer. He's developing. He's come uh, on. We have high hopes for him, et cetera. Now, to the, to the haters, this is just like a big uh, sarcasm, uh, you know, party because it's like, wow, the guy you drafted at 12 has a chance to uh, be a starter. You Tra drafted, traded up for Yeah, the guy you drafted at so 32. So I see which side you both are on. At 32, 34, and 66. Just, those were the picks used to just convert need them. Full context of how yeah. hilarious it is for a head coach to be saying about a player going into year three. Drafted 12th. The 12th player drafted is it's not, trying to be a full-time He's going he's to make a push. He's, gonna, he's, he's gonna going to make a, for it. He's going to make a push he's to be a full-time starter. That's, so, so I know which side both of you are on, which is to well, make fun of this comment. But yeah, this is a player that didn't play until, what, 13 weeks into his rookie season. It was basically a lost season. Mm -hmm. Last year didn't play until week five. Right. So I'm not saying – and this is – him – acclimating to a team that had an identity without him that was a winning football team that obviously he is not he has not matured as fast as maybe some have hoped but he also missed a significant amount of time i the whole argument of like you can read this quote and be like well that's awesome because we all watched him play football and when he had snaps and opportunities he made big time plays at the nfl level he just didn't get a lot of those opportunities last year that's yeah. that's my view i mean he he, he had significant plays in the playoffs and in the regular season, there weren't a lot of them. So when you tell me, hey, this guy who's super explosive, like, I mean, he has the physical ability of a Jalen Waddle, right? Yeah, absolutely. He can go out, he can, he big plays, doesn't need as many uh, opportunities as other players because his plays are going to be big ones. And you tell me he might be on the field every time. I have a little bit of optimism. When he was coming out, he was my number two ranked wide receiver. The talent, the speed, you know, outrageously high ceiling. Um, I totally understand, obviously, missing most of your rookie season. You you knew that with his injury. And, and I do get the fact that when he came in, you know, he missed the first four weeks this last year. And when he got back due, on the due to suspension, just right, in case right. people uh, he were wondering, bet, he, a betting yes, suspension, he, yes. not not performance enhancers, uh, made some dumb bets and got suspended. So week five, he comes in and he comes into a team that, like you said, Andy was they were established, they were winning, they were they were succeeding. The offense was clicking, and so you didn't necessarily have to have him come in and and say, well, now that we got this guy, let's change let's change who we are. Now they've got a whole off-season program. They can integrate him more. I I think, is there hope for Jamison Williams? Yes, there is hope. There is a clear path. If I have to be a betting man and say, do I believe he's going to hit to the ceiling that he has, I would bet against that because he still has been on the field a lot. The After the bye week, when they had that chance to integrate him a little bit more, they did. He was on the field after the bye week for, what was it, nine total games. He was on the field for over 60% of the snaps. 61% from week 10 on. Yeah, and so yeah. And, and he had one game where he scored 10 fantasy points. He averaged yep. six and a half fantasy points. He didn't do pretty much jack squat with all those reps. So, okay, you get him up to 80%. You know, maybe that's him being a full-time player. He's going to need to do more, not just snaps on the field, but more with his snaps on the field, his targets per route run, um, you know, the, the behind the scenes metrics, they're just not good. And and when you've seen a player on the field as much as him, I know it feels like we haven't seen him on the field, but that's the point And that's the problem. He's been on the field and you haven't seen it. He's been on the field. Some he's been on the field. Some a lot, some for, mm. and very few. I mean, the targets started to go up at the end of the year. So he had some games where he was getting targeted more. You're talking about a top 12 pick in the NFL draft. I'm not writing him off with – he has basically a season worth of games, right? I mean, he played yeah. a handful of games in his rookie year, and then he missed the beginning of this one. So he's got a, a year full of uh, of games. So, look, hope, that's a that's a pretty easy bar to say, okay, we think he's got some hope. What does it translate to? 
So here's the ironic thing. The second part of the quick question was, is he worth a late round pick in redraft? Absolutely. So we're going to talk about that on today's episode. Oh, yeah. I, I, I got an answer. So okay. my answer now is yes. Yeah. The I, I like players like Jamison Williams next year as a flyer more than I like taking some run-of-the-mill veteran that has a baseline of catches that won't do anything to help me win my league. So my opinion for, for but Williams. But you're saying my opinion might change based on what you say. Uh, his best ball ADP, Kyle's giving it to us right now. He says wide receiver 49 in the ninth round. That's absolutely at that point you what are the signs of life for anybody what are the signs of talent so when mike, i am perfectly fine with that yeah when mike gets to his first thing to remember this this applies yeah it, it actually multiples for him so his uh his targets per route run or yards per route run through two years is at 1.42 i'm actually we're going to highlight a couple things later on in the show talking elaborating more uh about that and is that a red flag, green flag, those those types of things? But it the quote is just hilarious. Like the, it's that's all that that's what it is to me. It, this this conversation is it's unfortunate the way that the career has gone for Jamison Williams. But for your coach to say a guy drafted number twelve overall is pushing to be a starter, it, it tickles my funny bone. But in the ninth round, I'm all for that. And also, oh, the the last thing I forgot to mention. Right now, Josh Reynolds is a free agent, which Josh Reynolds is not a superstar, but Josh Reynolds had a very distinct role for this Lions offense, and if Jamison Williams can take over that role and expound upon it by being a better talent on the field, good things could yeah, happen. He had, uh, Josh Reynolds will be the freest of agents after those drops. <laughs> Josh Reynolds played 71% of the Lions snaps. This there week. you go. News and notes from around the league. Oh man, I forgot the, <laughs> I forgot the playoff game. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't good. Um, oh no, Johnu Smith has been released. The Falcons uh, saving some money, letting Johnu go. He made thirty-five million dollars over the last three years. Good for you, Johnu. Uh, and and his entire job for those three years was to make Hunter Henry and Kyle Pitts managers upset. <laughs> that was all he was doing. Yes. Uh, because no one ever started. Stay away from the Chiefs, Johnu. Don't you dare. Oh, yeah. Uh, MVS. I do I do think this is actually news for Kyle Pitts, though, because, you know, Kyle Pitts, it was also reported that he is healthy from his knee yeah, we did injury. Yeah. Um, we know they're going to have a quarterback change. It's TBD on that. But Kyle Pitts now becomes the tight end. You know, there's not a secondary tight Because Johnu Smith took a lot of work away and was kind of in the role that we wanted to see more opportunities for Pitts in, like the easy stuff. Give Pitts some of the easy stuff. Don't just fly him down the field. Obviously, a new offensive scheme coming in, but I think we'll see Kyle Pitts used better and get, uh, right. obviously, Jason's more of back the targets. In. I, I, I feel myself inching back uh -oh. in. The yeah. Chiefs released Marquez Valdez Scantling saves uh, him. Two-time Super Bowl champion. $12 million. Um, key cog uh, about, uh, on a couple of plays. And uh, goodbye. Sayonara. They're working to get Chris Jones locked up. That's sure. that's the big agenda. And you know that because they franchise tagged Legereus Sneed and they have now given him permission to seek a trade, which he will do, and I think he will find, and then he'll get paid. And so they are uh, willing to let him go potentially. And the the mock drafters out there, mock is in real NFL draft. Man, they are tantalizing us all with some – <laughs> with some wide receiver names at the end of the first that would cause quite a stir. Oh, I, we've seen we've seen ten of them, and yeah. I and and that's the Clyde spot. So beware, <laughs> that's where Clyde edwards alaire shows up. Yeah, it's not yeah. going to stop me from being excited. It's true. You take a first round wide receiver there, and you put him with Mahomes in a place well, where let, he. Let me needs test it. it out. Hold on, Troy Franklin. <laughs> yeah, Ooh. I've seen Franklin, Worthy, Brian Thomas. Um, I've seen uh, Adonai Mitchell. Um, the list goes on. We've got, uh, you and know, we'll see who Patrick. If Patrick Mahomes has a recommendation, yeah, don't, don't stay, away. stay away. Don't go take away it. from that one. Yeah. Uh, you make the pick. Yeah. Um, at, <laughs> Let the team do its thing, man. All right. Uh, the Buccaneers are moving towards re-signing Mike Evans, first ballot Hall of Famer. Uh, Jason Light. Uh, 
I like that you're on board with I, it now. It's fun. To you speak. have no choice. What, I mean, he's a, he's a my guy. Yeah. I mean, um, he says uh, their GM said, we're going to do whatever we can to make sure that he's a buck. Including releasing Shaq Barrett. Yeah. Which they did. Yeah. So, uh, and then Chris Ballard said uh, on Wednesday that Michael Pittman will be on the Colts. Yeah. That we built this city. And he said whether that's via franchise tag or contract extension. So, Higgins, hey, Pittman, probably man. not going anywhere. He's money. Yeah, he's, he, you were you said that he'd get paid. I wasn't positive. Oh, but. he's going. He will get paid. All right, any other news, Brooksy? You got anything for us? No, sir. All well, right. did you see Zach Wilson? He, oh, He was granted yes. permission to uh, seek a trade. Which oh, I, I saw news. that, and I thought Groundhog Day was going on because I, I thought that was news like a month ago. All right, so, like, did it? Am I misremembering that, or did they put it out I there? I don't. And there were that. no takers, so they're just like doing a whole new press cycle, like it never. Like happened. the guy who puts the guy in the trading block the next week <laughs> yes. after no one makes him any offers. Yeah. They're like, "Hey, check ever, this out. I got a player who you may be interested." You in. ever pulled the guy off the off the trading block on sleeper? Because then, if you put him back on yeah, the block, it notifies it sends, everyone. It sends another notification. Who hasn't done that? I hope they start reporting. For the first time ever, we are <laughs> making Zach Wilson available. Are are like USFL teams allowed to trade for NFL players? Uh, I don't know because I think that could happen. Yeah, I don't think the market's going to be teeming with interested parties. Not at that contract. Although we know that there are some coaches that think that they can do special things and if a player is drafted as high as Zach Wilson they might give up a 6th or 7th round pick for him oh, man. whoops but then he might have to play for you and that's really where the rubber meets the road alright let's take a quick break and then we'll come back and uh, hit the 10 things to remember Uh, this just in, uh, Zach Wilson still hasn't found a new home. Oh, I thought you were going to – Zach Wilson allowed to seek a trade. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's true. I mean, he's uh, – Breaking news. You know, honestly, if I was, you know, Joe Douglas, I, I would seek to trade myself. Yeah. I really wouldn't leave it up to Zach. I would go get it done. All right, let's get going. Can you put him on eBay? <laughs> Don't forget to remember these things. All right. Well, this should be fun. I'm looking forward to uh, hearing what you guys have in store. I have not previewed any of your different things to remember. Okay. I hope we're not remembering the same things then. <laughs> uh, that's, that's a fair point. Yeah, there's a possibility that we that we are. And if we are, Mike, uh, just do the whole Jets, Zach Wilson trade thing. You got just, it. Just say it like it's brand new. All right, um, looks like we're going to kick it off here at number... Number 10. Number 10. Quarterback loyalty gets you zero fantasy points. And um, that was really, really true this year. It's something to remember Boy, moving, was it. moving forward. Um, because last year we saw a resurgence in a willingness to draft some quarterbacks early. Right for that that we had just come off the Jalen Hurts, Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes year, and um, it kind of reminded me of like, you know, Aaron Rodgers had like a, a a ton of seasons at number one, and and so he felt like a, a completely sure thing where you would draft him for for a number of years in fantasy. So there was some willingness last year, but I'm going to tell you right here, right now, if you draft a quarterback early, or even in the middle of the draft, it is very natural to feel like you are committed to that player you're drafting a onesie position so you only start one quarterback if you're not in super flex and a lot of the times you know we're, we, we spend months preparing for our drafts and we we think we have conviction about a certain player and we take them and if you take them at quarterback you're naturally taking a big name right these are the headline makers in the nfl they're the ones that uh make or break games and so you know, even if you're taking a Justin Herbert and and he's the sixth quarterback off the board, that's a big name. You feel committed to those players. This year, Patrick Mahomes was the was the number one quarterback off the board. He was the quarterback 19 from week eight on. Now Josh Allen was great. Jalen Hurts pretty good, although it slowed down at the end. Lamar Jackson was the quarterback 17 for a six game stretch. Uh, Joe Burrow, 
Justin Herbert both got hurt. Justin Fields missed time. Trevor Lawrence was not good. Deshaun Watson missed time. And was not good. And was not good. If you show loyalty to players at the quarterback position for too long, you cost yourself. People won championships this year with Dak Prescott, who really didn't start the year well at all, was a 10th quarterback off the board in the late eighth round, and there were a lot of people hesitant to move on from players that they drafted. I mean, Russell Wilson was somebody that was a relatively interesting pick for people to make you know, last year, and if you had been loyal to Russell Wilson last year when you saw things going downhill in Denver, he was that cautionary tale then. This year you had a number of those guys. Trevor Lawrence, I think, would fit that mold a lot. He ended the year so strong, and people were probably starting Trevor Lawrence too long. Yeah, I think the best example from this last year of, of remember this for next year, that things don't stay the same at the quarterback position, is the Dak Prescott and Tua conversation. Because the first five weeks of the season, once you're five weeks in and you're going into week six, you feel like you understand everything. You feel like, oh, I got it. I know, I know who's what's what. And Tua was like locked in. Every week you've got to start him. He was the quarterback five. Dak, worthless. He was the quarterback 21. It's like, you you know, we, we know. We know how this season's going to end. Tua's a superstar and Dak sucks. And then if you played that out and you just stayed put and you had the loyalty, the brand loyalty to the quarterbacks that started hot or that you drafted high, it, uh, it did not work out outside of Josh Allen. Right, and, and, and even Mahomes, right? It wasn't just these like later picks like Tua and Dak. Like Mahomes was the hardest on people. Yeah. Because you felt completely stuck. Um, I, I know that you know a lot of people that had Mahomes also had C.J. Stroud, right? They picked him up off of the waiver wire, and then it was like, well, I'm never going to start him over Patrick Mahomes. Like loyalty to the quarterback position year after year, unless you hit on the one or two guaranteed MVPs of that year, which do fluctuate, right? It was Lamar, but how many years have we had undue loyalty to Lamar that actually cost you? I mean, the first two years after his MVP campaign – People started him no matter what, and they literally lost games because of it. So have a willingness, I would say. It's not a necessity that you pivot because of one bad game. I'm not saying that. I'm saying having have a willingness and hold, you know, have a, a loose grip on the quarterback you draft, be willing to play the field, and when you see these offenses change and become better, believe maybe a little bit yep. that you can play those guys. Yeah, I'm actually hit the number. Number nine. I'm going to move one of mine around because it just it kind of piggybacks on what Andy was talking about. And I'm saying for this one, don't get cocky. Your team always, always has to get better. And in the, what I'm saying in there is sometimes there are moves that you need to make that are not your typical move where – like we don't, you know, resource management of fantasy football. I don't like to roster two quarterbacks. I don't like to roster two tight ends. You're saying don't get cocky with the with the team with you the have, team that you yeah, have, even if you're having success. And because there could be players out there available for you that you feel like mm, my team is good. I don't need that player. I don't. And uh, again, to piggyback here is I had the inverse of what the successful. <laughs> quarterback move was I had Tua I traded for Tua when when things were looking good and I talked on this show about my belief that Dak Prescott was about to go on a huge run because the schedule looked so fantastic for him Dak was sitting on my waiver wire and I like I believed to my core of all my analysis that no Dak is going to go on a run but I don't need him because I have Tua I don't need to go pick up Dak, and that was idiotic. Like I should have made the if if nothing else to block my opponents from getting a quarterback who I think is about to be fantastic. Thank you for not remembering. You're welcome. That. I had well, one of those, Mike. <laughs> I had a guy that was on fire. He was catching fire four weeks in a row. Looked like the real deal. His name was Josh Downs. And you made me a very easy trade offer to. Yes. Oh my gosh, I forgot about yeah. that. To get Michael Pittman for and very I, cheap. For very cheap. And but your team was good. But you my didn't team need was good. to do it. I did not need to do it. I was solid. And had I done it, I think uh, your I season looks a lot different. Looks a lot different. But like sometimes that is 
I should have just picked up the second quarterback. It's not a move I normally make, but I need to be prepared. Uh, leaving More and more, I'm getting comfortable with the idea of leaving my draft with two tight ends. Just for week one, have a guy where that I believe in this player, and then maybe a player where um, – Let's see what happens. I like, I'll, let's see what happens. Let's talk about the the the, the beginning of the season. Uh, we did a, and uh, this is not supposed to be a, a full toot toot thing, but we always do an undrafted gems, Got, like guys to look out for. They might be on your waiver wire after the draft is already over. And I, I'm like, dude, Jake Ferguson and Sam Laporta, both of their schedules to open are basically the number one and number two uh, tight end schedule that we with the data we have, and. Both of those players went on to be really important and got off to you know pretty good starts. And it's your team is not as good as you think it is. It takes one tiny thing to go wrong, and if you're not prepared and on already making moves Can to I, get things, for, uh, yeah, please. I was just in. gonna give you another example, which is like a, a perfect example would be somebody who started the year with Kenneth Walker and Travis Etienne as their two running backs. It would be easy to say I got it figured out at the right. at the running back position and not add or not build some depth behind them, and then boom. And that's my my kind of final point here is talking about the your fab or your waiver priority. You too often, you, you as I'm talking about myself as well, I'll look at my roster, well, I really need, I got to figure out this wide receiver problem I have. I'm so good at running back, I'm not even worried. But the top two pickups of the week, say, are running backs. And then I don't go hard after them because I think I'm good at that position. And someone else gets Kyron Williams in week one, you know, just as the easiest example, because you think you're good. I don't need to go after Kyron. And that was an incredibly bad mistake because it just takes one injury to one of your two starting running backs and you're not – It don't get caught up and just don't – don't get overwhelmed and fall in love with the smell of your own farts looking at your <laughs> roster. Always be trying to improve it. Yeah, it is uh, It is one of the great illusions of fantasy football that what you're staring at, that perfect, beautiful specimen of a roster in week four, that's 4-0, oh, the greatest illusion is that you are going to get to see what that team will do in the playoffs. Yes. Because it doesn't happen. It almost never happens. I cannot remember a team. I mean, my dynasty team last year seemed – we were talking about how lucky I was getting with injuries week 10, 12, uh, yeah. 13, and the shoe finally dropped, right? So, yeah, it, it is a good thing to remember that, um, look, when the roster looks nice, take a picture, but it's not going to last very long. Yes. Prepare yourself. Number eight. This one's called – Smell your own farts. The good ain't bad. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> That's Sorry. right. Good ain't bad. Remember that. Yeah. Um. Young stud players who have proven themselves on the NFL field. They're like they came out and they're like, wow, that they're really good. They're sensational. They are not going to go away just because the team brings in depth and more talent. And that's a lesson I needed to learn from this last year, specifically the two players you just mentioned, Andy, Travis Etienne and Kenneth Walker. Both of these teams went out and got a day two running back. High draft capital mm -hmm. for a running back. Tank Bigsby comes into Jacksonville, and it was like the, both Travis Etienne and Kenneth Walker prior to the NFL draft were guys we were really, really, really high on. Um, you know, we, we did our early rankings shows, and Kenneth Walker, he's just a stud. But then on in the second round, they go and draft Zach Charbonnet, and you're like, he's ruined. <laughs> Kenneth Walker's ruined. Well, I, I got – um unreasonably mad <laughs> yeah oh yeah that I, was the maddest you'd been all year i know exactly where i was <laughs> <laughs> like you remember I, the moment i remember the moment i was sitting in my office and the news came through and i was a level of mad for a pretend game that i should not have reached yeah it's one <laughs> it's one of those things where i thought for sure that with that kind of draft capital coming in that these running backs would not usurp the talent, but just destroy it. Just destroy the fantasy value. And obviously, you know, at the end of the year, Kenneth Walker got injured um, and, and Travis Etienne slowed down a bit, but that wasn't because of this backup that came in. They were both workhorses. They they were both workhorses because they proved themselves already. We saw it. The NFL team saw it. They, 
look, if you dominate on the field, then you're you're good. You you're, you know. So I think about this year. Like, well, who could that happen to? Like, Kyron Williams dominated this last year. If they go out and spend a day two pick on a running back, I'm still going to be in on Kyron Williams. The team needs depth. Every team needs depth. Um, we just talked about, you know, don't rest on your yeah. laurels. Pe you know, build, yo, you're, you're good at running back. No, you're not. You're never good at running back. Go go add someone. Um, and that's true for NFL teams as well. So, um, Nico Collins, Tank Dell, there's been so many rumors of uh, the Texans going out and, and getting – a wide receiver in the draft or going after Mike Evans if, if he becomes available or whatever the case is. It's like if, well, yeah, Alvin it, Kamara last off season, he seemed like he was set up for the worst scenario. You're going to miss time. Mm -hmm. We like Kendra Miller. Yeah. Jamal Williams. And it's Alvin. David yep. Montgomery. You know, they, 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 they spent a huge draft capital. David Montgomery was still very good. If you're a very good player, you're a very good player. And when, and I want to be less afraid this season about, Oh, so and so added this player, so now my guy is ruined. No, if the guy's good, he's gonna get his. The team is just better. Who was ahead of Keyshawn Vaughn in Tampa when that happened? Because I remember people being afraid of Keyshawn Vaughn in Tampa Bay. I, oh, but I don't I, remember who the starter was. I don't know if it was it was probably Fournette at the time. I, that I think that checks out. But I mean, it, that was you know, draft season's very fun. The NFL. It's the bright lights. It takes over the whole world. So I think it's very easy nowadays to lose perspective on the way a team is built and pay so much attention to six months' worth of rookie and best ball drafts to lose sight of the fact that these players not only perform well on the field, but they also establish relationships with those teams oftentimes. So, um, yeah, it, it, it's a big-time uh, – Good reminder to have. Number seven. All right, let's uh, let's look at number seven here. I've titled it uh, "Lose a Trade, Win a Title." I'm excited for this one. Uh, look, I I have a bit of a reputation around these parts as being maybe an aggressive, persistent trader. Mm -hmm. Would you it's agree? A, it's a that's a nice that's reputation. a nice way to put it. Yeah, I mean. Um, and, and one of the things that I think holds a lot of fantasy players up is they are unwilling to lose a trade perceptively. Yes. And I think that that's a, it's a pride thing. Um, it's obviously trying, you're trying to do the work, right? You're trying to make sure that you're on the, the perceived winning side. Everybody wants to win the trade, right? But what do we define winning the trade as? And, um, you know, for me this year, uh, what I think is important is that you want to make sure that you're getting the difference-making player on the roster. We've talked about that before in two-for-one, three-for-one trades. But early in the season for me, what I recognized was that there were two players in my mind that were league winners definitively in fantasy football this year, and they were Amon Ross St. Brown and CeeDee Lamb. And I know that a lot of players that we have in our league, opponents, teams in our league, when you get into trade discussions, sometimes it's like they have to have the last word. Right, They have to have the last tweak to the deal. They have to make sure that they have one little tweak or one little addition, and it can disrupt the ability to get a trade done. And so the thing I want people to remember as they go into next year, if you have that conviction, the conviction that Mike had about Dak Prescott, the conviction that um, many of us have about certain players as you get halfway through the year, if you believe somebody's going to be a difference maker slash league winner, what I'm saying is, is be willing to go out and lose a trade in the public's perception, right? In your league's perception to get the trade done. Because You're saying Vontae Mack, no matter <laughs> what. Von yes. Yeah. I'm saying you go Costner. I mean, Co you go Costner. Yes. If you have yeah, to go you Costner. I don't care if I'm I perceived as a winner. I wouldn't trade up to number one <laughs> right, right. to do it, but, you know. Do it just no matter what. <laughs> Don't get bogged down in the tiny minutia details. Don't get bogged down in the little asks and the pesky additions to the trade. If you want to get these players that are very hard to get, for me it was waiting for a couple of teams to kind of get on the fringe of contention and then throw the kitchen sink at them to guarantee that I can get one of these players onto my roster. You know, we've talked about the philosophy. Obviously, if you do a two-for-one, three-for-one trade, you get to – 
go right to the waiver wire and pick up a couple extra names if you've traded three for one. Um, I think sometimes people get worried that they're going to be criticized for the trade that they make. But if you have the conviction, like I did, that C.D. Lamb was a must-add if I wanted any chance at a championship, be willing to lose the trade in, in the public perception if you want to win a title. It can, it can make the difference. Don't get bogged down. It's not like every player at the moment a trade is being made is going to play the exact same way the rest of the season. I think sometimes people just get stuck, and that's why deals don't get done. Yeah, that's fair. Sometimes it's because we're just cowards. Yeah, and and I think that that is, um, it's like the fear of of the loss is more powerful yeah. than the potential of the victory. But we're not playing to win second or third, and I think it's really important to be willing to to throw something else and, in to get the player you need. And it's, I would even tack on a thing at the end: be willing to to lose perceptually lose the trade, and just be willing to be at the end of the day swing like. You may be wrong. I mean, it, it worked for you this time. Yeah, you could be. You could be wrong thing for sure. Is, but oh, you, I've done those trades and they get hurt the next week. I mean, that that kind of stuff but can happen. The point of you're playing to win. You're playing for first place. You're not playing for second. You're not playing for third. So you have to be willing to take some gigantic swings. Because if you strike out, whatever, man. What it it's not the difference between. But if you hit, it's you're talking about a a forever championship. You are is very hard to win a title. Very it's hard. Very yeah. very difficult. Number six. All right. If the risk is uh, this is not a catchy title, but it's just it's right <laughs> to the point. Uh, if the risk is already built into the ADP, don't be afraid. And we have too many players every single year that we're all nervous about a new situation that has happened to that player. But it's the, the it's fantasy football is the game of economics and things that happen we get afraid to draft players their adp goes down and now the risk of ev of of everyone being correct it's already baked in there it's our it's already in there some examples stefan diggs with minnesota was an emerging player where his final three years with the team uh what finished as wide receiver 20 in 14 games wide receiver 11 in 15 21 in 15 games he gets traded to the Buffalo Bills, which I still think at the time, with the information we had, Josh Allen did not look like a franchise quarterback. He was coming off of, I believe, two straight years of being the most inaccurate quarterback in the league. And so we all got nervous about Stephon Diggs, who Stephon Diggs looked like a rising superstar who just got banished to a land of mediocrity. And at that time then, he was going in the sixth round as the wide receiver, 27, and he has a massive breakout campaign. He has a Josh Allen has the huge, massive breakout campaign. So those that had the courage, which it, that my point being, it, it's not really courage. We were all scared to draft him, and he went in the sixth round. He's drafted as the wide receiver, 27. It's like a real Jamison Williams <laughs> type of risk. That, that's what I was talking about yes. earlier. It's like it's baked in if he's in yes. the ninth. Yes. And that's why I'm in. I like I'll draft Jamison Williams in the ninth. If I'm wrong, I don't really lose anything. Jamar Chase as a rookie in 2021. It's laughable at this point. The risk was baked in. He was being drafted in the seventh as the oh, wide receiver gosh. 30. And that like that seems that seems so ridiculous that that couldn't have that couldn't have been possible. That what? we were all so dumb we let him go into the seventh. He had a lot of drops in preseason. He did. He and he couldn't catch the ball. And yet he just like Jamison Williams. He was uh, 81 for nearly 1,500 yards and 13 touchdowns. Geno Smith takes over as the quarterback for the Seattle Seahawks. Russell Wilson's out. There's panic in the streets. DK Metcalf, yep. who was just the wide receiver 12, was being drafted in the back of the fourth. Tyler Lockett, who was the wide receiver 13 previously, plummets to the wide receiver 40 because it's impossible. We These guys can't – there's no way to do it with Geno Smith. They're both fantastic. Nope. Mike Evans this past year. Mm -hmm. The risk is if it's baked into the ADP, you have you have very little to lose and you have so much to gain. It's a lot like the way the stock market moves when you're talking about the risk or the situation it, being yes. baked in because in those situations exactly, so people had played the season out already in their minds. Yeah. And then – 
come up with the worst possible outcome for all of those players, and then that's exactly where you're drafting them. Um, that's, you know, it, it looks nice now, but that's why Mike Evans was the the strongest I've ever been convicted about a my guy ever, which I, I told you guys that mm -hmm. in the studio. Yeah, yeah. It was like... You said that on the show. It, and it was because he was so undervalued and everyone had anticipated a guarantee that this is how the season will play out with Baker Mayfield. There was just not a lot of risk to me in, you know, turning to a player like that. And and those examples you brought up are great ones. Um, and identifying those in draft season. Yes. Uh, you know, more of a challenge, you know, trying to find those players that. Because they're scary. They, yeah, they these, already, they should be scary. And, and, and it feels when you're when you're there and you're at their ADP, you're like, am I going to be the guy to to draft this player that's fallen so far from where they were? Like, doesn't that mean they're old busted and I've got to be wiser? But but you're right. Like, if the risk of them failing means they finish where you're drafting them, <laughs> right? Great. There's only upside. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll take another quick break and come back, Jason. I hope you're ready. Number five. Number five. Draft enigmatic backs. Say that again. Draft enigmatic backs. Is that one word? That's one word. That's it is now. Enigmatic backs. Enigmatic backs. Okay. Uh, you want to draft enigmatic backs? And what I mean by that. <laughs> uh, trademark. Yeah. Uh, tra <laughs> go to that, go to that domain. Um, enigmatic backs. Enigmatic, <laughs> enigmatic backfields are scary. The ones where you, you just don't know who who's the guy. I I don't know the situation there, um, but yeah. So I just I don't want to go in. Yeah, like I'll I, let someone else figure it out. Exactly, someone else will figure out this. We're, we're not even sure who the running back is, so I don't want to take the shot and then just burn the pick. But the thing is, is most of those backfields don't cost you a heavy pick, and there are always emerging assets from that type of backfield where you're not sure who it is. If you look at this last year. You had the Miami Dolphins. You had a, a, a new undersized rookie in Devon A. Chan coming in, and you had a super old veteran in Raheem Mostert. It's a good offense, but like I don't know, I don't know who the guy is. I don't. I'm just gonna let someone else draft him. That's why they were drafted as the running back 42 and the running back 45. And it turns out they were they was okay because they finished as the running back 24 and the running back two. Even if they hadn't. Like even if Raheem Mostert had not finished as a running back too, of course it, hindsight is so easy. But looking back, we all had kind of projected Miami would be a high-powered offense, mm -hmm. and it's someone, some a running back is going to score. It will not be the running back forty something. Yeah, but you didn't know who it's going to be. So yeah. how would you draft him? Just take take your shot, and maybe you're wrong. Like this next backfield. I was I was wrong on this backfield, but I don't I don't have any problem right I admitting that because I saw I saw the shot for one of these enigmatic backfields, the Rams, Cam Akers and Kyron Williams. You had uh, uh, Dan Graziano on August fourth write this quote: "They they look at Cam Akers and Kyron Williams as their top two backs, likely in that order. The Rams believe both can pass protect, but they like Williams a little more as a pass protector than they do Akers." So while Akers is likely the nominal starter, Williams could carve out a role and be the guy they lean on in the run game if something were to happen to Akers. So it was like one of those something happens. <laughs> yeah, something happened. Um, I I I liked Akers. He was the running back twenty one. That didn't work out. But Kyron, if you took him, which some people drafted him very late, or most people picked him up off of waivers, obviously we know what happened there. He was a sensational superstar. Um, you, you've got these situations, and there, it, it's not always like the Kyron Williams and Raheem Mostert number one back coming out, but the, the commanders last year, is it going to be Gibson? Is it going to be Brian Robinson? You know, they were drafted, Brian Robinson was drafted as the running back 36 because of that. It's like, uh, you know, it's a muddy backfield. And you always, you, you pretty much, because of the value of the workhorse, the Christian McCaffreys and the Saquon Barkleys, you're only looking for like that. <laughs> and and yeah. I think that's sometimes a mistake because there's only a few of them. But there's a lot of running backs you need. So it's okay to take part of a committee where you're not sure who's going to be the lead guy because it's probably a value in the draft 
and they will they will rise out of that. Brian Robinson finished as a top twenty four running back. Well, I think especially in the cases of Miami and Los Angeles, the extra layer there is that you have teams that you had tremendous confidence in their running game. You didn't know which running back it would be, but you right. knew that the Rams could run the football. You didn't know which running back it would be in Miami, but you knew that they were going to have an offense that could run the football. And so I think if you wanted to add an extra qualifier there, yes. you could say like enigmatic backfields, you know, on teams backs. you know, on teams that have a history of being successful or coaches that would be successful there. All right, we'll move on. Number four. This is this it is my turn, right? It is. Um if it's not, it is now. Uh, well, look, I'll be quick. Uh, I've titled this one, The Little Things Kill. It's my favorite Bush song. Oh. That is from that, that is from a Bush song. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Is that it is just your favorite? Little things? It's just little things. Yeah. yeah. All right. And um, look, uh, this is the 10 things to remember. Um, this is something that I literally did halfway through this season. And the reason I'm bringing it up in part is we are going into season 10 next year at the fantasy footballers. And, um, you know, I think that there's probably a few people that are a little bit like me in our league of record where ugly, ugly, smelly, <laughs> smelly. What else you got bad clothes, guys? What bad else? Clothes. Too tall, bad clothes. Very much too tall. Um, smelly. We're no, we, you, are, we you already said that one. one. Uh, Dang it. But really smelly. <laughs> you started off real hot. Look, I had a couple of championships early in the league of record and, if you were listening to the show for a long time, maybe, maybe you started to take your league over like I thought I was. And um, about halfway through this year, I look, I've been in the midst, I was in the midst of a pretty decent drought of winning championships in League of Record. I had had so much success. Me and Mike played each other in championship games three straight years a mm -hmm, long time ago. Mm -hmm. Things just felt easy for a while. And then they didn't. You want to know why? Because because we started giving them our information. Well, yeah, we, we started a <laughs> podcast and told them all of our inf information. But the truth is, is that uh, many of you, maybe you had success early on listening, but the competition does get better in your leagues. And I wasn't, honestly, I wasn't willing to accept that. I believe that if I just kept going on the exact same way, it would just all work out like it always had. I had grown a little bit complacent and I had to have a meeting about four or five games this year with myself, and it was literally. Did you, did you schedule it? I did schedule it. It's in my Google Calendar. Was there and a, I, a mirror? I uh, no Zoom. We oh, did Zoom. Oh, yeah, incredible. So there was Zoom on in a mirror. Right. Yeah. Um. So look, I had the one-on-one -on -one meeting to my with myself, and I said, like, I can't keep doing the same thing I've always been doing. I have to pay attention to the little things if I want to get back over the hump. For me, that meant. A little extra free agent prep every week, which, look, on this show we try to help you with. A little bit more persistence on the trade offers or finding those players I think can be league winners. Sometimes it's not just about trading a bunch. Sometimes it's about doing the work to figure out who you need to trade for. Not activity that doesn't lead anywhere doesn't help you. Um, sometimes it's paying a little bit more attention to some of the dirty work that's not very fun, like playoff schedules for players and future schedules for players. Some stuff is more fun in fantasy than others, but it all helps. Those little things help lead to victories, and they add up over time. And so I think a lot of us here, maybe we've had success in the past. Maybe you're like, man, I won a title, but it's been four, five, six years. What am I doing wrong? For me, it was the little things. It was a willingness to reevaluate a few small areas, and it led to success this year. It's obviously very difficult to win in fantasy. So I think those things do add up. The little things kill. Got the went back to the fundamentals. Yeah, really doing his push-ups, grinding. <laughs> That's right. Um, it was the meeting though. It was the one on one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So really basically, things to remember: schedule something, self meetings, self meetings. Yeah. Number three. Let's talk a little dynasty fantasy football here. We're gonna call this one "Know the Thresholds." Hmm. As in dynasty, one of the harder things to to make a decision on is young wide receivers who aren't immediately superstars, when do I know? When do I know that this I I drafted a lemon and I need to move on? When do I know I got to give somebody some pa uh, some patience here, like Jamison Williams? Do we need to give him patience to grow into the player that the Lions hoped for when they drafted him? Okay. And so we talk about targets a lot on this show as it's an earned statistic, as if a player 
is is getting open, is building that trust with their quarterback, they're going to get a target. A, a route gives context to just the opportunity that the team is giving them. But players can be out there, uh, MVS style, running routes on every single play. Cardio Kings. Getting like three targets a game. And I you now see where MVS is. He is looking for a new job as they're saying, sir, you have not earned enough targets. We need to look elsewhere. And so we looked back over the last decade. These are at wide receivers drafted in the first three rounds because still draft capital is the king of signal to will, will a player actually be good or not. So here, here are the metrics. This is a little heavy in statistics, but bear with me. Through two years, on average, a first-round wide receiver averages about a 20% target per route run and a 1.68 yards per route run. Second round, wide receivers, their yards per route run at about 1.55 on average. And the third round, wide receivers at 1.4. Now, these are simply benchmarks to help guide your decisions. It is not saying if a player is under it, they are 100% toast. But it's you may want to think about this because, honestly, through the last decade, the only player who has really resurrected himself from the grave was Devontae Adams. Was it, Devontae, that dude sucked. Devontae Adams through two years. Remember how hard was, I was on him? Oh, we, we were all. And I was like, he never had a thousand yeah. yard season because he was at 997. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, was just, it wasn't even just that. It was through his first two years, it looked terrible for him. I, I believe it was year two that Jordy tore his ACL, like right at the beginning of the year. And it was, thank goodness they have Devontae Adams. It's your time. And he did not come through. So it was, no, this is never going to work out. And now Devontae Adams over the last however long has been one of the best wide receivers in in the league. So we're going to take a look back of of what we've seen now. This is two years ago because you're collecting the data. Uh, at the top of the class, Drake London, Olave, Garrett Wilson, they're at the benchmarks. We're not worried about it. Both Christian Watson and George Pickens are sitting above the threshold. Uh, and they're volatile, definitely. It doesn't. I don't know if we're going to – See them turn into studs, but we're okay. Watson and Pickens. Yes, on Christian Watson. Here's now where it gets a little sketchier. We're calling this one keep the light on because there could be some hope. So maybe if you're they're on your roster, you're just in a hold position. Jamison Williams. He is at one keep the light on. He is at one point four two yards per route run, which is under the threshold we want. Again, the threshold is just a uh, kind of a, a level that you're hoping they're above. Traylon Burks, he's yeah. at 1.28. He's sketchier. And Wandell Robinson, he's there with Jamison Williams at 1.42. Uh, honestly, just putting Jamison Williams with those other two guys, <laughs> it, it really, it does not give me a lot of confidence it, uh, for well, Jamison Williams. It highlights where Because I don't believe in those other two at all. <laughs> Keep a dim light on. You know what I mean? Like, don't, He's at the top of that group, right? It, he is no, at the, not I mean, really. he's he's tied with Wandale yeah. and but Wandale was also not a first round wide receiver. So Ugh. he's he's overperforming compared to Jamison Williams. Uh Jahan Dotson is on the cliff. Yeah, he's of, the next tier and it that looks scary. And then the guys where you're just where you I think you can pretty accurately Say goodbye. just move on. Unfortunately. John Mechie, uh Houston Texans, Tyquan Thornton, Alec Pierce, Sky Moore and the Sky People. <laughs> Uh, Va I don't, us. why are we putting Valus Jones in here? That's just mean to him. Uh, Jalen Tolbert <laughs> and David Bell, who once upon a time was hoped to be the next guy for the yeah, Cleveland David Browns. Yeah, David Bell sitting in our dynasty uh, waiver wire. If anyone's interested, but we have a we do have a huge article coming out here, uh, highlighting all the thresholds and things. But it's just it's a metric. That's in the dynasty pass. It's in the dynasty pass. Yeah, thank you. It's a it's a metric for you to be aware of because. What's nice about dynasty wide receivers when you draft them, even when they stink in their first year, more often than not, they at least hold their value. Like Sky Moore was – it was atrocious that first year. And there was so many glaring red but signs. But now that MVS is gone. Was so many glaring oh. red <laughs> signs saying, it's not going to work for Sky Moore. I know the draft capital was there. I know the team is there. It doesn't look like it's going to work. But the hope was still there. Like there were still things of you could trade Sky Moore over that first offseason. I'm not sure you're gonna be able to trade Sky Moore uh, this far into the process. So be aware how a, a wide receiver where they were drafted 
compared to how they're performing through their first two years to help you make an, a real educated decision about, do I wait this out or do I try and move on? You know, on? And, and I'm sure, uh, like you said in that article, to get into all the details, I think the big headline that I took away from that from practical advice was that if you pay attention to those thresholds, you know whether or not your belief in a player is is justified by the metrics or is going to be an uphill battle. Like, I think that's what fundamentally I would be saying. Like, if this player does break out and have success from this point forward, they will be doing something that is unexpected. And yes. that is saying something for the odds are not in their favor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, historically speaking, it, it, it's, it's so wild how you can look back in history and find these numbers and you're like, they still – like they, they just, hold they true. hold true. Yeah. yeah, the 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 Sky Moore example is the example because we we knew it. We talked about these metrics yeah. about how he was on the field as a rookie quite a bit, and he was really really bad in that in that uh, you know targets per route run yards and per route yards run. per route run, and so it's like it, you know it 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 never works out. I mean these people somehow delude themselves into thinking it might, but <laughs> but it might work. <laughs> For us, let's get that quote. Yes, let's get that quote back in here again. People always think it, but that's the time to get out because because there were people still thinking it's going to work. There's a Tobias Funk in your in your league right now who you can find one of these metrics and trade a wide receiver to them. Number two. All right, thanks, Brooksy. This is the Brooksy special. I call it the preseason pretenders. Don't get fooled. <laughs> I give every year we get fooled. It's so hard not to. It's so hard because we're so excited for football and we want to see things. And I went back. I, 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 I wrecked and we my wanna brain. And we want to trust people, Jason. Uh, we want to trust people and and we want things to matter in the preseason. Well, we things want, to go on. We, we watch these games. Follow the signs. We're looking for something that matters because, I mean, one, that's, a, that's our job. Like when preseason rolls around. I'm watching these games whether I want to watch them or not, and I'm trying to look for something tangible. and And I need to remember to stop. <laughs> like <laughs> I need to stop. We do so much research through the off season. We have so much historical data. We we go through so many training camp reports that are that are in depth and 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 long winded, and watch coaching press conferences and and we develop as solid of opinions as we can based on the information we have uh, this last year I was so out on Damian Pierce I we had like three shows where I had a tangent on how that fourth round running back you know it, yeah we argued about it yeah it, it just doesn't work and and then a new regime came in and brought in a Devin Singletary a veteran running back who's a quality back like oh man it's, I was so out sounds on sounds like you're talking about Kyron now though <laughs> I, I was, <laughs> what if Devin Singletary goes to the Rams yeah well I've got two things to remember yeah sorry, um, go on. so yeah I mean and then and then all of a sudden in a preseason game oh oh baby 89 percent of CJ Stroud snaps at preseason week two went to Damian Pierce. He's the dude. He's going to be the pass catcher. But he was not. And I got fooled. And Andy, thank you. I had the 12th pick in uh, that draft because I was the reigning champ. And Yeah, I took Damian Pierce. Only thank you. But I was, go I was totally going to take Damian Pierce. I was so, yeah. I was yeah. so angry when you yeah. took Damian Pierce because of, because of just a preseason game. And let me illustrate how the preseason well, – and, and the season before, but go on. It, it, the preseason <laughs> game is not always indicative of future success. The Steelers' offense was amazing in preseason. The Steelers' first-team offense had five touchdowns on five drives in preseason. They looked great. Jerome Bettis is talking about Kenny Pickett has the potential to be a superstar – but he was not a superstar. There are so many, in, you know, examples of this. Um, the the Javante Williams injury that we knew the timeline, like we yeah. knew it, we knew it couldn't work that out. That one, that one still hurts my feelings. We knew it's just like medically impossible for him to be be a rock star. But he got out in preseason. He played, and it was like if you now we do learn things from time to time for preseason. Um, who was the uh, orange Julius? Julius Thomas. Yeah, Julius Thomas. Yeah. We. We saw that breakout coming because of preseason utilization, uh, the tight end that year. But what it wasn't is it wasn't a change of 
strongly formed and informed decisions that we had made over the entire offseason. If you have a really well-informed opinion that you believe in based on a lot of evidence, don't let I'm talking to myself here. Self meeting. Well, get, get on my get me on my Zoom. <laughs> Tank, Bi Tank Bigsby was another one. Yeah, because it was like you know you guys uh, you know he had an opportunity in the preseason looked pretty good. I I, I really want to which make plays sure into your earlier one but that I do not overemphasize preseason. That's this year. that's the key because you do need to emphasize it. It's just a matter of like in fantasy football. I think our our tendencies because we want stuff to talk about is that you go from witnessing something to making a pronouncement about it rather than just factoring it in, right? Like y you could say, look, I'm not really a believer in Damian Pierce. He's looked pretty good this preseason, but fundamentally this is still my concern. But it's easy. It's so easy to go from, well, we were wrong. He's got a – this coach loves him. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it is uh, – I'm going to de-emphasize. I am – because – Ooh, that my natural my natural human nature will automatically emphasize everything I see. It, it was just there's just no way I I'm gonna go in and try to de-emphasize yeah. it this year. Just say in your head, just say you sure about that? Yeah, with whatever you see. Every you sure about that? Yeah, yeah. sure about that this way. Um, okay, and it, yeah, the, there there are many examples of uh, situations like that. The preseason, you get vanilla offenses. Right and defense. You get vanilla defense, and you get vanilla That's defenses, and you get different uh, first team, second teams playing each other. The, I think in in part the preseason has become less and less of an indicator over time as well. Yes. We reduce the total amount of games. We don't play starters very much. Uh, we want to see different things from different players, and you go out there and you're not executing what you know a normal game plan. Yeah, looks it used like. to be the third week of the preseason. You're seeing two teams really prepare for the season with their main personnel packages now. You've got to do heavy research even to see, like, wait, okay, is this player going against a first-team defense or is this is, is that cornerback their, their, their backup? You know, it's like – Yep. No, it makes sense. Yeah. It makes sense. All right, we've got one more because we always share one at the end here. Number one. Now, Jason, you titled this one. Yeah, well, I'm a big fan of the movie Remember the Titans. Yeah. And this is a, this is a show about remembering. Okay. I want you to remember the turds. <laughs> Remember the turds. Remember the turds. In your league. So what are we saying? We're saying that. Uh, I don't know what we're saying. Well, we don't. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> we could have said it differently, I suppose. But uh, this is the reminder that the things in your league that cause you to have a bad experience, which may include a handful, a couple, single, there's all sorts of turds. Mm -hmm. uh, but if there's some managers in your league that didn't add to the experience, if there were rules in your league, league formation uh, settings, uh, week 17 or 16 or 18 championship games, sorry, week 18 title games, this is the time to kind of remember what went right, what went wrong, make the adjustments, get them in place. Maybe there's leagues that you were saying, man, I wish our league was like that league over there. Or I wish that this one manager set their lineup ever. This is the time to make the adjustments to uh, to boot out those turds mm -hmm. and to get things right for your league. Lace up them boots. Now, I usually uh, go with the flush. Oh, we could have flushed the turds. But I, so you guys. No, we don't. You're, you're don't. actually like drop kicking a, a poo. I, I'm drop kicking it straight from the source. <laughs> What? Never, never hits the ground. <laughs> it's incredible. Pretty, pretty. That's that's quite the image. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's a backwards kick. <laughs> oh, it's like a mule kick. Yeah, it's a mule oh, kick. Okay. Yeah, when I'm camping, okay. you gotta Wait, boot what, out them. What turns. do you mean when you're camping? Yeah, well, I'm not doing it at home. I gotta, I gotta bidet. Wait, you do this for what? yourself? This is a joke. This is a joke. <laughs> no, I know. I know. He's like, stop, stop. You're the one who said camping. Well, I mean, uh, where else are you going to kick turds? You, I mean. You doing good, Brex? How are you doing? Oh, over yeah. there? oh, I'm doing great. Did you learn anything from that last one? That's That was the most important one. That was? Definitely. Thank yeah. you, Brooks. Is there anything you uh, you needed to remember? I know I'm putting you on the spot, but is there anything from this past year that, uh, like, do you remember You guys, how old your Dynasty team is? 
Uh, yeah, <laughs> start to remember that. Um, just in general, not playing afraid, which is a lot of your guys' points summarized. That that's my problem. I was out of trades, and I go to it's hit ho- offer, and I don't offer do. them. You know, I I think that's I think that's a good self acknowledgement because I I look at a, a s- several people in our league, and it's usually the people that are hard to trade with. And I just watched. I literally watched them hurt themselves. Like it's annoying. I'm annoyed that they don't accept this trade or can't trade with anybody. But like I, I often think like I feel like you're like pre-setting them up. Like <laughs> no, I, I genuinely have had the thought before, of like, dude, you, you are such a coward that you don't help your team <laughs> with the trade with you. No, no, no. Oh, okay. With the, the whole league. Yeah, no, specifically. Yes. <laughs> All these cowards out there. Not taking, cowards. My, not taking my deals. Hey, take my trade, coward. <laughs> That's a good trade method. That's often work. What are you, what are you, a chicken? What are you, a yellow? Um, I get too on. attached to players, certain players. You know what? That no, I, sure. I have that problem too, Brooke. That's a really easy thing to do um, with these long off seasons where you fall in love with certain players. That's, it's hard it's to, my It's my beautiful fantasy baby. I found it feels you. better when you I find made, them. Yeah. I made you. <laughs> feels better when you find them and then they have success and they're yours. Yeah. No question. Um, so there you go. There's 10 things to remember for this past uh, season. Uh, one more thing to remember. Uh-oh. Is you've got a day left to get in right. on the Ultimate Draft Kit giveaway. We are giving away a listener league entry in a couple of days here. Uh, we will be giving away someone the first person playing in the 2024 yeah. listener league will be known soon and that you can join you gotta, the league and then not be a coward and trade with jason yeah don't be a coward trade me all your good players uh, <laughs> a, a brave man would give me that player <laughs> but yeah get the ultimate draft kit at ultimate draft kit.com uh, there's so much resources it's, it's a tool you're going to want this year anyways so get it now because it's the cheapest price and you're automatically entered in the giveaway i do want to let people know so, uh, an update for you which is our dynasty podcast which i think is um we're not even a year old are we with the dynasty show i I believe was it april we just recorded our 50th episode 50th episode it's been very um well received and i want to let you know it's now available on youtube with video whoa so we made the jump on episode 50 it seemed like 50 we're like all right Um, we'll keep kyle and bets around and um i can kick it you can watch Jason headbang for the through the intro, mm-hmm. and you can check that out. There is a separate YouTube channel for the Dynasty Podcast, the Fantasy Footballers Dynasty Podcast. So please check that out if you are somebody that enjoys it on YouTube. That'll do it for today's episode. Thank you for joining us on the show. Next Tuesday, we will have free agent predictions. So that'll be your next episode, unless you had to join the foot.com right now. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FFBallers.